Please be seated for our reading. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John chapters 18 and 19. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with priests from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them, and they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement 
and be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself up against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king, but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put in the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jews, Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since, since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also come came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. For the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. After all the politicking of the high priests, all the small-mindedness and the bloody-mindedness and the vindictiveness, after the betrayal of friends and the brutality of soldiers, 
after the fickleness of the crowd and the indecision and impotence of Pilate, they laid Jesus' battered and lifeless body in a borrowed tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was really sticking his neck out when he took Jesus' body for burial. He'd been a disciple in secret, we heard, because that was safest for him. He showed great courage in this final act of devotion, as did Nicodemus, who had only come to Jesus secretly under cover of darkness in the past. They lay Jesus there in Joseph's tomb. So what now? Silence. Shock. Grief. Disbelief. Fear continued, perhaps. And darkness, too. Disorientation. Silence. Broody, restless silence. I'd always been uncomfortable with silence, even dreaded it. Because in my experience, silence meant there'd been an argument and relationships were strained. And then, during my ministry formation, I was introduced to silence and I encountered it in new ways. I was introduced to new ways of experiencing silence, of engaging with silence. And I learned that silence is not nothing. And it doesn't need to be threatening. Silence is something. It's a thing. It's more than emptiness. Silence can be formative and restorative and life-giving. Silence can be the destination of our prayers so that we're better placed to listen and to hear God's affirmation that we are known and loved beyond measure. In her beautiful poem, Praying, Mary Oliver puts it this way. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be, wor- it could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together And don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Whatever happened in the silence and in the darkness of death for Jesus generated life, just like a seed buried in soil germinates and becomes a source of new life. When our journey takes us through dark and difficult places like betrayal, the fickleness of opinion polls, suffering from injustice and false accusations, or even the valley of the shadow of death, we can pray and cry out to God who hears and understands and is fully present. God in Christ has suffered betrayal from individuals and from crowds. God in Christ has suffered injustice at the hands of dysfunctional or corrupt legal and religious systems. God in Christ has journeyed through pain and suffering as one of us. God is not in isolation from the viruses and injustices of our world. Isn't that good news? And God is not present with us in full PPE. Jesus, God incarnate, lived, lives amongst us as one who is fully accessible, fully present, fully immersed in human life and completely aware of our trials and tribulations. So I wonder, what is it like for you right now hearing this this story up to the point where it says, 
And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. We've been reflecting recently on the power of story to convey meaning and to create connection. I wonder, where do you find yourself in today's narrative? Did you come across yourself as George and Barbara read? And what makes you say that? And what's it like for you to sit with the silence that we encounter at this point in the story? Where do I see myself in the story? How does the silence sit with me and why? Well, I'd like to share two Good Friday stories of arriving at a place of silence. They're memories, precious memories that I have. And the first is a happy story. I was 14, I think, roundabout, and away on our youth group Easter camp on the Shoalhaven River. Friends were there, and it was good. Great weather, beautiful surroundings, fun, friendship, and I think we even had a campfire. The camp was shaped around an Easter Bible study and worship. Like most 14-year-olds, I had my own personal struggles and questions. Was I good enough? If I didn't achieve high standards, would people still love me? Am I fat? Am I pretty enough? I have a memory of sitting quietly beside the river in the morning sunshine. I'd chosen to be alone and I felt very content and at peace to have some quiet time. As I sat, an awareness washed over me, perhaps for the first time, that not only was God's love for everyone, God's love was for me. As I chose to receive the gift and to take it into my heart, the world I lived in didn't change. But what changed was my strength and courage and resolve to share this gift of love with those who were easy to get on with and those who weren't. And the strength and courage and resolve to accept the things that I couldn't change and to make the most of them. My teenage angst didn't disappear but being grounded in God's never-ending, never-giving-up love, no matter what, helped me to navigate my way through. While I imagine there probably was noise around me that morning, people chatting and just general camp activity and maybe insects and birds, the memory is of silence and a profound sense of being held in God's love as I was for who I was. The silence, as I look back, was felt, feels like a safe cocoon where I could be formed in new ways to take on life and to live as best I could as a young person of faith. The second Good Friday memory that I have that came to mind without even trying is from a sad story. But it's not despairing because it was shaped by the first it was a very long story, so I'm going to make it really, really short. In March 2009, our youngest son was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive brain cancer after he had major biopsy surgery. The diagnosis was a shock to everyone. A few months earlier, he was a fit, healthy, fun-loving 16-year-old boy. Now he was bed-bound and losing his sight and his hearing. Thanks to the compassion and foresight of his surgeon, Andy was transferred from the Gold Coast to the Royal Children's Hospital, which was still at Hurston at that time. So he could be cared for as a teenager. He went by ambulance and we drove up by car just a few days before Good Friday. He was admitted and one specialist after another came to visit and they all confirmed that nothing could alter the trajectory of the cancer ultimately. One amongst them became a good friend and his name is Dr. Anthony Herbert. He was 
a wonderful palliative, um, paediatric palliative specialist who did miracles, really, to help Andy um, move comfortably through, as comfortably as he could. Andy was dying, although that brutal fact was far too much to be taken on board by everyone in our family at that point. Those few days were so busy and so overwhelming, a flurry of discussions and meeting new people and taking on board what they told us and caring for Andy and for our other children. And then came Good Friday and quietness. Oh, the relief. There was quietness inside the hospital and on the roads outside. And the silence gave us time to simply be in our shock and disbelief and perhaps anger, perhaps fear. No going to church and doing what would have been really normal in any other year. And at some point in the day it rained. And then came the rainbow. A glorious, full, vibrant rainbow. And by a great, um, wonderful serendipity, we have a little teddy bear called Rainbow with us in church this morning. Rainbow's visiting from Newcastle, so that's very wonderful to have Rainbow with us. I was sitting in Andy's room looking out over Victoria Park, and there it was. Out of the silence came the most beautiful rainbow, a profound reassurance of God's presence. I was reading John's gospel throughout this time. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, says Jesus in chapter 14. In the silence, the rainbow formed. God was visible and present. The rainbow reassured me and brought me peace and reminded me that God was indeed present especially in the people who surrounded us at that time with enormous love and compassion and great skill. The memory of that Good Friday rainbow appearing out of the silence has stayed with me and become even more meaningful as the years have passed. Andy died a few months later. And through my journey of grief, not only for Andy, but also for our way of being family together, I've experienced the grounded reality of the presence of the one who passed through death and deep silence and overcame its constraints to bring life in all its fullness to the world that he loves, no matter what is going on. There's nothing about my story that makes him more important than anyone else's, and you don't need to compare it with yours. That's not the point. In fact, please don't do that. In my sharing, I'm inviting you to consider your life with God. And if there's anything that you would like to share with Stuart or me of any of our ministry team at any time, that's what we're here for, to journey with you through the silence. And so I wonder, when have you found yourself in a time or a season of silence? What or who has reassured you? How have you experienced God's presence in that time? How have you struggled to experience God's presence? And do you have a memory that offers you hope? We're going to have a few minutes a little later in the service when you might be able to respond to some of those questions by writing on the dove or simply holding the dove. But we'll come to that. Perhaps a season of silence has been a family or relationship struggle. Perhaps it's been around accident or illness. Perhaps it's been during COVID in his wonderfully insightful book, Ed Ayres wrote in his book, Whole Notes. In the words of Benjamin Anderson, bass trombonist with Orchestra Victoria in Melbourne, 
I think one of the interesting things I've noticed throughout the pandemic for both me and for a lot of musicians is how profound the loss has been over this year. It became really hard to actually engage in listening to music. It was triggering to listen because it reminded you of your personal loss. And Ed, Ed, Ed writes, Benjamin, along with many musicians around the world, spent much of 2020 in musical silence. From the last performance before the mid-year lockdown in Melbourne to the next performance, Benjamin had 250 days where he could only play on his own at home. How does a musician cope with this? How do we cope with the time of silence? There are some really reassuring words in Psalm 62. And I'm going to read from Nancy Merrill's Psalms for Praying. For you alone my soul waits in silence. From the beloved comes my salvation. Enfolding me with strength and steadfast love, my faith shall remain firm. In the silence rests my freedom and my guidance. For you are the heart of my heart. You speak to me in the silence. Trust in love at all times, O people. Pour out your heart to the beloved. Let silence be a refuge for you. For you alone, my soul, waits in silence. From the beloved comes life, love and light. They laid Jesus there. Silence. Silence is something, and out of silence, new things can come. Heard from a few poets this morning. I'm going to finish with the words of Malcolm Guyatt, one of my favourite poets, poets. He writes in his poem, Jesus is laid in the tomb, which was part of a series that follow the stations of the cross. Here at the centre, everything is still. Before the stir and movement of our grief, which bears its pain with rhythm, ritual, beautiful, useless gestures of relief. So they anoint the skin that cannot feel, soothing his ruined flesh with tender care, kissing the wounds they know they cannot heal, with incense scenting only empty air. He blesses every love that weeps and grieves and makes our grief the pangs of a new birth, the love that's poured in silence at old graves, renewing flowers, tending the bare earth, is never lost. In him all love is found and sown with him a seed in the rich ground. Amen.